Hey, everyone. So I am back here with Alan Howarth, and we have the long-awaited, long-awaited for me, uh, studio uh, section of the interview where Alan will be showing us some sounds that he's created. And this is for a new film. You want to tell us a little bit about the film, Alan? Sure. We're going to experience two, two of my latest films. One is a movie called From the Shadows, which is this, uh, this poster right here. And that one actually comes out this Friday, which would be October 29 on Voodoo. It's currently running in theaters, limited thing. So that one's done. But the sounds we're gonna experiment, I just have another one that will be released later. This one's called Dante's Hotel. The director is Anthony C. Ferranti. He's my buddy that was the director of a movie called Sharknado. Okay. And he's also, he's also a horror movie guy. So, so interesting in Dark, Dante's Hotel, it takes place on New Year's Eve in a, I'll say a haunted hotel in downtown Los Angeles. And so I'm the first 30 minutes uh, just to finish the, the scenario. So, so actually the director had actually three different composers on this movie, all friends, obviously. So I'm doing the 80s setup. Hence, I used all the analog synths and stuff like that. And about a third into the movie, the next composer, Chris Cano, does his stuff. And he's there's a party going on. So he's doing all the dance music and the other stuff integrated with score. And then there's another uh, another Chris at the end where now we literally open up the gates of hell and Father Time gets involved and it goes, goes wild in a sort of an orchestral way. So the movie shifts three different music genres as it goes through the three acts. Oh, okay. It's fun. So, so anyhow, he hired me to be the 80s, uh, what you expect a horror movie to sound like. And then I opened up uh, these Arturia ARP 2600 uh, Priest, you know, plugins. So that's what we're going to experience is the plugins for Dante's Hotel first, and then we'll go on and we'll do a trailer from From the Shadows, and you'll, you'll get the latest movie also. Okay. So I'm still active. Uh, also coming up, um, I've been doing a lot of uh, horror movie conventions. Today is September 27, yes? 26, I think. 26, 27, whatever. Something 20, 20. like that. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, we have a Halloween 45 convention in Pasadena this year. Every five years, all the Halloweenies get together. So that's all my buddies, you know, all the screen people, and I'm I'm composer and all this other stuff. Then I have a New Jersey Horror Con uh, on October 2021 in Atlantic City. And then I have another one on Monster Rama in Atlanta on the Halloween weekend 28-29. And then a third one, the Hot Springs Horror Film Festival on November 5, and we call that the Halloween Hangover. So this is my season because of all the Halloween stuff. Right. <laughs> great, great. So um, this is really exciting. So that's a poster behind you. That's a promo poster. Of one yeah, of that, the that's, that's a From the Shadows. So that, that'll be the one we play the trailer for. Okay. I don't have a poster for Dante's yet. Uh, literally just finished it. But it, it'll be on streaming and probably by mid-month because the, the nice thing about the streaming is, you know, they finish it and they can put it on the Internet the next day. So, whereas a feature film, there's a whole big roll up and a marketing campaign and the publicity. And, and we just had a red carpet uh, event for Shop from the Shadows this last Tuesday in Los Angeles where the actors came. Uh, some of the actors, um, the one guy here you'll see, that's uh, Keith David. He's also was in The Thing. And he oh, was wow. also in uh, They Live. So he's a John Carpenter alumni. And then we have Bruce Davidson. And this lady's name is Sel Selena. And I'm going to forget her last name. I apologize, Selena. But they're the three principal actors. It's interesting. Um, we'll talk about the story when we get there. Okay, great. So are we going to start with the trailer? Uh, we can start with the trailer if you wish. So uh, just as a bit of storyline, I don't want to say it's, it's along the lines of the fog in that these two scientists crack a dimension, and in this case, from the dimension are coming these shadow people. And so in the fog, it's they have a ghost ship and there's ghosts on the ship. In this case, you crack a dimension, whatever. So it's in that, in that genre. And the, and the producer said, gee, I'd really like to have John Carpenter's music. And my friend Cecilia Hall, who I'd worked with from the very first Star Trek, and she did I did Top Gun with her and uh, Airplane and... We got an Academy Award for the Hunt for Red October for the best sound effects. So she's a sound effects person. She says, well, I know Alan Howarth if you want to talk to him. So I got on the phone with them and, and sort of in a screaming 
limited schedule, right? Because they had had somebody else and it wasn't working, and that's why this whole thing came up. So I, I did the score, score this in about three weeks. So it was oh it was wow, intense. it was intense. <laughs> and, and and so at, back to our buddies, our other composer friends out there. When you get into that situation, you start. You can't have creativity on demand. That's good. I mean, you can throw some junk up, but to do good, I have some things that I've worked on in the past that were like what I needed. So uh, I remember my, my teacher at UCLA, when I was studying film scoring, he says, you know what you do is you just take these ideas, you don't know what you're gonna do with them, and you kind of put them in a drawer. Someday you're gonna need them. So I went to the drawer and I started pulling stuff out. So that's, that's what happened here. All right, so let's let's You have roll. your own library to draw from. I, exactly, it's about a minute 28, here we go. Joseph Call, killed in a fire late last night alongside 18 followers of his infamous hidden wisdom cult. How did you all get involved? Me too. Joseph said you were very special. Joseph found a way to draw upon extra dimensional energies. The same energy followed us from the house. I started seeing shadow people. Fantastic. So it's a it's a movie. It actually holds up very well. Everybody, you know, when you do independent productions, it, obviously money is uh, not the same as the big studios. There's no limos. Uh, catering is limited to uh, Boston Market instead of <laughs> something else like that. Uh, but it's good. And you know, as as a composer. I'm coming in at the end. So this, like I said, I was, I was like, I'm like, if you, if somebody's baking a cake, I'm the icing guy. I just come in and put the, the, the last icing on and maybe a few cherries. Sure and, a <laughs> and that, that's what we get. So that's that one. All right. So let's, let's continue on. Okay, let's great. Move, we're going to now move over to opening up logic. And this is logic, uh, logic pro um, it's on a Mac. I'm a logic guy. My two main tools are logic and Pro Tools. So I, I, I was raised on Macs. The Macs were hipper in the mid 80s than the PCs were. So we kind of got brought into the Mac world. And as it, as it grew, Logic now comes with the Mac and it doesn't come with a PC. Yeah. So they a little political shifter there. So these, these are now Arturia presets or Arturia Arc 2600s. And I have different presets on it. So this is the, this is the, sequence for the movie Dante's Hotel. What I'll do is I'll, I'll go through a couple of the sounds. Um, I have like five 2600 setups we'll go through and talk about how they work. And then I'll run a little clip from this movie with these guys playing. Okay. So that, that'll be fun. So this first guy up is my one of my bass notes. Uh, and so here I'll give you... And then again, that's triggered by the triggered by the keyboard. We have the, um, the the primary oscillators all up coming into the filter. As you can see, it's got full sustain on it. And then there's a little repeater because of the sequencer. Hence, it repeats and goes blah blah. So that's pretty much how I use it in the movie. And this is one of the motifs for when the bad guy shows up. It has an almost vocal sense to it, right? Yeah, there's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, the fil the filter is 
is your main tool for shaping the sound. Oscillators are going to go bah. So, so the cut of the, the, the ADSR is what's really doing the shaping here. And I also chose, actually, I chose these, these presets because in the, in the 80s, this was my main tool. Now, I have still the original ARP avatar behind me here. Yes. But it's basically an Odyssey or 2600, and it, it's similar. But the sequencer, the ARP sequencer, was the other part of my main axe. So I always had the sequencer on the ARPs. So like when I did Escape from New York, there's all this kind of bob, 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 bob. Or the, like in the, in the main titles, there's a sort of a thing that's similar to what, uh, what was in the hood. So that's, that's the, the ARP and the sequencer doing their job. And so that's, that's how those guys worked, all right? I don't know if I told you this story about having um, lunch with Brian Eno and he was talking about producing bands. And one of the things he does with the band is he actually restricts the technology. So instead of the band being able to use the entire universe of, of, of everything, he says, okay, we're going to use analog synths or we're going to use real drums or we're going to use only guitars or whatever. So, so the concept is like, remember when I had a thousand piece picture puzzle, you would do the frame first. So he frames, we're going to make this album out of this. And the reason he's doing that is to imitate what used to happen in the old days when you only had so much, you had to get more out of what you had. And that's part of his method methodology with working with uh, it, new players. It, it inspires creativity. It is, and that, that was what, that's what triggered that, because, again, I was always getting more out of this stuff than whatever it was ever designed to do, and I get creative, and th those creative necessities... Is the mother of invention. <laughs> ...push the envelope, and then we did more stuff than we thought we could do, right? All right, so this is our one. So this one's a... So this guy's using the pulse width modulation. Up here, you can see this guy's... Especially this one oscillator here is patched in to modulate the third oscillator from here to squeeze that guy down with an envelope. So, so that's part of the tonality that comes when we hold down our note. I'll be right. So you'll hear that one in the score when we're introducing a new a new pan as we're as we're going into another another something to see whatever that is. In this case, it'd be sort of dead bodies and yeah. that's, you know, horror movie stuff. But we're not seeing anybody stick the knife in or anything like that. I mean, they're just, they're dead and we're trying to figure out what happened here. So that's our, our, um, our preset there. Now, see, I'm going to have to keep doing this just to make it all work. But uh, again, if we just want to look carefully, it, it's all, the green ones are coming up from the keyboard. Let me get out of here. Green ones are coming up from the keyboard. They're triggering the oscillators and the filter, and then it's through a standard ADSR out the output. But again, it's, it's this tonality that the even the Arturi imitation of the ARP oscillators and the ARP filters are really accurate. That's why it sounds like an ARP. You can do a Moog filter, you can do an overhang filter, you can do a Roland filter, and that's part of what the characteristics of analog synthesizers were. Because you know, square wave is a square wave, but Sine wave is a sine wave, but going through the filters and whether it's a 24 dB per octave, 12 dB, 6 dB per octave, bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera, that's how you're shaping because your oscillator is putting out all your frequencies to start with. So it's, it's subtractive synthesis. You're taking away so much of it to get it down to or black based on the harmonics that, you, that the filter lets you. So. How can you goes. see the, um, I can, it's hard to see the bottom of the sequencer, the very, very bottom. Yeah, I, I don't know if you can move it up slightly because we can see the suitcase yeah, top. Sure, let, let, let's try one more time. Slide these guys up a bit. There we go. So we can see all the way to the keyboard. How's that? Right. So that's an emulation of uh, 3620. This is one here, the morning the morning pad. We'll go back to that one and fool it one more time to repeat what we did. Yeah, all right. Again, so all right, the, the, the keyboard's here. You see in this case, if you play the sequencer, uh, it's, in this case, it's not going to do anything, but if we play it here, because you see the sequencer is not in the patch on this one. All right, this is strictly keyboard up to the 
the two oscillators with the modulation oscillator into the third oscillator, then those guys are coming up. You can see where the volumes are here. Mm -hmm. So that oscillator, this oscillator, and this oscillator come to the filters. These guys are choked off. And then we have the, the control voltage also going to the, to the filter. So the filter is going to open up with the keyboard. So it, it would be... So that's, that's the tonality. So this next one actually uses the sequencer, and I designed the main theme of the movie on this sequencer. So it's a 16 note sequence. So we can see on this one, in this case, now I've got the notes in the sequencer. We play it. Oh, oh, we're on the right channel. One more time. I didn't switch channels. And this this is kind of what it is now. If you're going to be on a computer with the software sense and you can't afford a, a vintage ARP, you're, this is the next place to touch these things. And they're pretty darn good. I'll, I'll give them a, a 90 to 95 percenter. It, it's not like it's amazing, but it's not horrible. Well, I mean, I may be a little bit biased, but the ergonomics of a 2600 so easily show the oh, yeah, well, of subtractive well, synthesis. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, consider that I'm playing with basically one finger, right? It's the mouse. So uh, I'm definitely restricted to do this. You can see how much fooling around we're doing to get to what would be the original instrument, which was made to play. I mean, that's the other thing is you can't get that much discover out of these guys. Because you're gonna you're gonna get into all this mousing around instead of touching it and having it play while you fiddle with the knobs. All right, so we're looking good here. All right, so back to if I play this now, you'll hear the sequence. Okay, so that's actually my theme for this score. Hmm. That's my main theme that I dialed up. Now, what I did also do is I, when I perform it, as I go through the score, I don't play the whole thing. I'll do. I'll get a little bit farther into the scene. Obviously, the octave, low, octave no, is probably more in the range we're doing. And that's how I went through the sequence, performing this sequence, but triggering it for a certain amount of the notes, but not the whole thing, until we got some action. And then we do the whole... again and pause because remember one of the definitions of music the most simplest is the alternation of sound and silence mm. especially mm -hmm. in, a, in a movie score silence is your friend not too much of it but as opposed to just painting the whole thing a dramatic pause says anticipation what's mm -hmm. next so here we are doing it Beethoven, Mozart, all the guys, they, they know how to do this, right? The orchestras. And then when we're finally like, now we're running down the hallway and we go, we just let it run. Action. Sequence. Hence. And, and as I mentioned before, when in all my 80s stuff, this this was the deal. The ARP sequencer and, and in this case, the avatars, but a 2600, same machine, basically. They, they didn't swap that out. So, all right, so we've now gone through three sounds of the five sounds I want to show. So we're going to go to the next track, which is the one we call organesque. All right. 
right so in this case again keyboard the keyboard is coming up and working against the filters we do have one modulator in here we have this uh, pulse wave modulation which is going against the filter so we're going to hear it going So there's a little tempo. It's not a lot. I mean, and certainly these are polyphonic, so you can do. Or in the case of a horror movie, we may go. motion and then this was one of the early lessons i had is these i mean what do you do with a lfo well it is not a sound it's now a modulator that makes the, the filters or the pulse width or whatever change over time and that can be fast and be a vibrato oh, 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 oh. or i i usually live as tempos they're a little built-in tempo so you got to set your oscillators for the tempo of the other piece um that was one thing I went back to Arturia. I was wishing that the tempo of the sequencer would drive the tempo of this. Uh, I mean, tempo of the of the logic would connect to the tempo of the sequencer. Not feedback from Alan. Well, guys, how about if you do this? Give me a way to patch that over and whatever in software, so it'd be more functional for us. Okay, so okay. that's that one. Let's do one more. This is my number five of my. Oh, art I do have a question. I do oh, have a question. Sure. sure. So going back to this one for a second, um, and forgive me if this is repetitive. I do see that you're you're um, you're patched into the sequencer. Um, no, actually, yeah, there there's patches sequencer. If we if we play it, it's not triggering anything. Okay. So so this was a, another. Mo I think this is part of the modulation. Going in, see in here the three okay. modules. So the this is part of the sequencer, and I well, I, let's do this. We do this, and we actively fool with this. Now, see, it's, it's not it's not driving anything new. Okay. Uh, again, I put these things together. There's cables in, and I twiddle, and I make it work, and I save it. So there might be some stuff here that's redundant, not being utilized currently. Good question, though. Thank you for catching me. Professor Dina. All right, we'll do that. We'll close this one. We'll go to the last one. And this is this is my big guy 2600 oh. guy. Right here's this is this is what the, the money shot. When I really want to make something happen big. You know, we've we've gone so far in the action, the bad guy's done his thing, and now we're hosed. I mean, it's 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 not going well. Denouement. Yeah, yeah. The, this is the, this is the one we use here to kind of drive the, the the big boy. And so I use this one near the end of the scene when we finally the, the deed is done and we're going. Oh shit! All right. All right. So he's here. And this guy is. And that's got a nice LFO that's opening the whole thing up. And you'll just sit there and do that as long as you want. And you can see it's pretty straight ahead. It's the oscillators, all three of them in the gang. Tuning is super close, but not quite enough. A little bit of detuning in there. And then obviously the keyboard's coming up on this guy, triggering triggering the gang to play. And then we heard this. We heard these kinds of sounds in Pink Floyd and the Moody Blues and. Yes, and Genesis. I mean, this is this is the 
the things that this machine did that everyone just embraced right away. Wow, that's a big, heavy sound. Yeah. Well, it's just one sound. I mean, it, it is polyphonic if we want to do it, I suppose. No, this one's just mono. This is this is the whole gang in big unison. It's not poly. Lower than that, it's a little. We'll see. It's, it's flapping off the end of the. the, the but it, but it is all these sweeping over all the harmonics, so that's 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 interesting. Okay, we're gonna go to a movie. Quick help go away. I'm gonna actually let's, let's queue up. I'm gonna play us the first opening title sequence of this one. It's about a minute and a half. Uh, actually, no, I'm gonna play you. So your total time, this might be about four minutes. Is that okay? That's okay. Check this out. Some familiar friends there, right? This is a New Year's Eve party that's not gone well. the dialogue turned off. This is musical. There you go. Hmm. So you heard my sequence. You heard my use of the parts of the sequence. We heard our big ARP guy go a couple times. And then the part of the, we didn't discuss is the bad guy, and we didn't know he's bad guy. The, the Dark Forces is actually Father Time. So in this movie, Father Time is arriving at his New Year's 
at the music party to do the harvest. Every 12 years, he gathers souls to take them to hell. It's his, his bag. And then our characters figure out some way to beat Father Time. So I'll do a stop to share. We can come back to you and me. It's not a spoiler alert, is it? No. No. <laughs> no, we'll figure it out. So there we go. No, I mean spoiler alert for the for the audience. Oh no. Yeah, yeah. There's enough clues laid through the movie, and actually it, it does twist and turn. So we we really won't know what's going on unless we take the ride. Excellent. Okay, great. Good. So the, the, this is a little little behind the scenes, a little bit of what Alan's still doing. I tell, I, people come to me to repeat what I figured out in the 80s with the analog machines. The last three scores, they said, Alan, I just want you to use the synths. I, you know, you're that guy. I want an orchestra, I'll go to Hans Zimmer. I want you to do what you do best. So I've got a legacy. And for me, that's very convenient because I really know how to do that. Yeah. You know, instead of me trying to figure it out, I have, I have a PhD in making analog sense for horror movies. <laughs> well, we're and we're very glad that you do. Yeah. Very glad that you do, and and uh, and 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 what a treat this was to to be able to see how you work and and like that. Um, well, thank you so much. I uh, I look forward to seeing these films. And uh, <laughs> with a pillow in front of me because I'm a scaredy cat. But <laughs> it, it's, it's funny when I, when I did Halloween two, which is my first movie that I got my mom to go see. She went to the theater, and you know it's a horror movie. And she said, "I covered my eyes, but Alan, your music still scared me. I'm sorry, I, I was scared <laughs> no matter what, even if I didn't look." So. <laughs> no, that's by design. That's what it was intended. Your, to. your work is done here. No, it's never done. But <laughs> well, that's the thing. If you can get them, if you can get one sense to be so important and deep, I mean that that's amazing, you know. And the combination of those who are, who are lucky enough to be able to see and hear, I mean, what what a, what a what a wonderful co cocktail of creativity. Yeah, and you know, one of the things I learned from John Carpenter is, as a as a musician, you tend to want to be very, I'll say, jazzy. You want to elaborate chords and harmonies and structure. But when you're doing music for a movie, as John Carpenter says, the music is just the carpeting. The movie sits on this messaging from music. Another another analogy he said was he says that the music is the director's velvet glove. This is how you touch people without them knowing they're being touched. To be sad or excited or feel love or be horrified, all that. So that's your emotional tool. And then uh, I'll, I'll give this one to everybody. He says, a good director has to know only two words, yes and no. Use them <laughs> often. No, give it me both ways and I'll decide later. That's wasting time and money. Just be decisive. He says, even if you say yes today and it's no tomorrow, that's way better than giving me both ways and I'll see what I, I'll see what comes next. Because you are a leader, you're the director, you're you're telling everybody else what to do. So don't leave the the helm flapping in the back of the boat here. Just grab it and go where you. Let's go here. Let's go here. Would you do you have any advice for budding sound artists? A sound? I, yeah, sure. Hear? So let, let's revisit this in the. In the movie business, which where I was raised, uh, we got to do sound for, in this case, productions that are 30 minutes, 90 minutes, hour and a half, sometimes two hours long. It's a lot of music. I don't think people have patience for that anymore. I think that the real future is in shorts. I mean, may, doing, look at TikTok. You get stuff in 30 seconds, a minute and a half, two minutes, three minutes, five minutes. Do that. And you can put them, you know, even if you take a, a scene from another movie and you score it and you put it up on your channel and you go, look what I did to this scene from XYZ movie. Make people aware that you exist. Because if you're in your parents' basement and you're just doing all this cool stuff on headphones, that's great for you and for learning, but sooner or later you have to put it out. I mean, another great definition of art, 
art in general, art is a communication. No matter what the media is, whether it's through story or acting or singing or music or images, you're communicating your ideas to someone else. So make sure your art is a good communication, that what you're saying is expressed so an audience or a listener can understand what your messaging is. Where, where are we going here? Where are you taking me? I, I'm, I'm, I've, got on your, I've got on your ride. Where are we going? So make sure that there's clear messaging. And then I'll say the last final, and this, this is really the one that boys and girls, young people, you're going to have to be technically savvy. Right now, being a, comp a composer or a sound designer, you need to be a technical composer, a technical sound designer. There are jobs on video games for technical sound designers. Yes, it's not necessarily all the super artsy, creative, playing with weird noises, but it's a job that you have a customer, you have a, you have a, you're providing a service for a larger production. In fact, that's a little tag. So my first movie was Star Trek. Before that, I was Alan the Rock guy. Then I worked for Weather Report, and finally I wound up on Star Trek. Well, you struggle in the music business. You try to put your record out, and nobody buys it. And your band, the band breaks up, and you got a, a van full of equipment. You, you work for Weather Report, and you schlep gear all over the world. But this is other somebody else's band. It's not your band. Finally, get to movies. I'm providing a service. Star Trek is going to be successful. Isn't it better to be with a successful project than struggling? So consider that just like a carpenter or a plumber or whatever. It's a service as to a bigger project, but the bigger project is going to have more bandwidth, more money, more budget, more possibility for success. Okay. Great. Sure. Um, well, thank you very much. And um, again, I really look forward to uh, being able to uh, see and hear these these films in, in their completion in the way they're intended. And I know that there's going to be a lot of uh, people out there that are really interested to see the pages and how you work. And I really, um, I'm grateful for your, for your generosity of time. Very sure. good. Glad to share.